Welcome to our next session of Health Matters. The title is Get Moving, Why It's Easier Said Than Done. It's going to be presented by Dr. Simone Gill. Dr. Gill is an exceptionally well-trained occupational therapist and clinical researcher, and I want to say also educator. She received her PhD in 2009 from New York University, an MS in 1999 from Tufts University, and a BS in 1997 from Carnegie Mellon University. Since joining the faculty at Boston University, College of Health and Rehabilitation Sciences, Simone Gill has um, obtained both internal and external funding. Dr. Gill has also received a service commendation from the American Occupational Therapy Association. She is the author of many publications in top-tier medical and rehabilitation journals with a focus on the impact of obesity on motor function. I know you're going to thoroughly enjoy her presentation. Thank you so much. My clinical background as an occupational therapist guides my research, and that's been the case from the very start. Fifteen years ago, I worked as a clinician in a school for children with developmental disabilities. One day, I was asked to work with a four-year-old girl, and the information that I read about her said that she had trouble with tasks like tying her shoes and coordinating her movements to make it through an obstacle course. So I planned a series of activities that we could work on together to work on those difficulties, and later I went to her classroom to meet her. When I met her, I sensed an immediate disconnect between what I'd read about her and what I suspected was a major contributor to the difficulties that she was having. She was four years old, and she weighed 120 pounds. From there, I embarked on a journey to understand how the makeup of our bodies influences the ways in which we move. This talk will focus on how obesity impacts movement and why the suggestion to get moving might actually be easier said than done. We receive important messages every day about the importance of increasing physical activity. The World Health Organization suggests getting 150 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity every week. That translates to half an hour of moderate to vigorous physical activity five days a week. Campaigns, many at the government level, have done a great job of increasing our awareness of the importance of increasing physical activity. And walking is a cost-effective way to increase physical activity that doesn't actually require any special equipment. So why are people falling short of the recommended physical activity guidelines? Why is getting moving easier said than done? There are several reasons, some of which we might know a whole lot about, and others that we haven't really explored very much. For many individuals with obesity, we know that obesity is comorbid or existing in the presence of other conditions, such as physiological difficulties. For example, more than half of the U.S. adults with type 2 diabetes are classified as being among the 78.6 million adults with obesity. And that comorbidity between obesity and type 2 diabetes actually increases medical costs. By 2030, medical costs associated with obesity-related diseases, such as type 2 diabetes, are projected to increase from 48 to 66 billion dollars. Obesity also impacts the structure of our bodies that support our ability to move around. Obesity, for those with obesity, they actually have double the lifetime risk of developing knee osteoarthritis. And that comorbidity also results in increased medical costs. This year, medical costs associated with hospital, hospitalization for knee replacement surgeries is projected to increase to $40.8 billion. And knee replacement surgeries are increasing for adults between 45 and 65 years old. That's especially alarming because this is a procedure that's historically more common among adults 65 years and older. One comorbidity which isn't talked about very much is that obesity actually impacts function. 
What do I mean by function? I mean the physical or motor actions needed to navigate safely through your environment. And the ability to do that has to do with making a match between the makeup of your own body and the tasks that you have to complete in the environment. So the makeup of your body might have to do with things like whether your joints can support your ability to move around in your environment. And the task is not only related to what you have to do, but how easy or how hard that task is. How long are the steps that you need to take when you walk? How high do you need to lift your foot to clear the curb and get onto the sidewalk? Making that match between your body and the task that you have to complete in the environment is what's needed to be able to get around safely in your environment. There are a couple of things about obesity, though, that make that challenging. Obesity impacts functional mobility, which has practical implications. Compared to individuals with normal weight, those with obesity tend to walk more slowly, take more steps when they walk, spend more time with both feet on the ground, and less time with one foot on the, gr the ground, and they also have balance difficulties, which cause them to sway more during standing. All of those things that I just told you about in terms of differences in walking related to obesity are presumably done in an attempt to increase stability. But those differences in walking actually predispose individuals to increased chances for tripping and falling. In fact, fall risks are 50% higher for those with obesity compared to those without obesity. So this really threatens their ability to maintain the consistent and vigorous levels of physical activity needed not only to lose weight, but to maintain that weight loss. In my lab, we use a series of paradigms aimed at looking how the makeup of the body impacts movement. In those paradigms, we use tasks that are similar to what you might encounter in your everyday life, like needing to speed up or slow down your steps. In one of our paradigms, we ask individuals to cross obstacles of various heights. And that's because most often the ground isn't really flat and uniform. It could be sloping, there might be obstacles in your way. First, we ask individuals to walk on flat ground just at their own pace. Then, we ask them to cross over obstacles of different heights, three different heights, low, medium, and high. And each of those obstacle heights is based on something that you might encounter in your everyday life, like a door threshold, a small step, or a tall step. And then at the end, they walk again on flat ground just at their own pace. As individuals walk on flat ground and cross obstacles, we use a variety of technologies to examine their body movements. And these technologies tell us about things like the trajectory of their movement through space, or how far forward and backward or side to side they move their bodies as they walk. In a series of studies, we looked at how childhood obesity impacted movement, and we used a commonly used measure, body mass index, to define obesity. Body mass index is weight in kilograms divided by height in meters squared. In these series of studies, we looked at differences in body movements as children walked on flat ground and crossed obstacles, and we compared children with normal BMI scores to those with BMI scores that fell in the obese range. The measures that we really cared about here were things related to increased safety risks, like how high they lifted their feet as they crossed obstacles. When we looked at differences in walking on flat ground, we actually found none. Now, that might sound counterintuitive based on what I just told you about how obesity impacts walking. But if you think about it, when we walk around in our everyday environments, we have to navigate up, down, and around obstacles. So testing individuals as they walk on flat ground might only really be revealing a part of the story. OK, here's what happened when they crossed obstacles. The graph that you're looking at on the left shows children with normal BMI scores. The graph on the right shows children with higher BMI scores. On the x-axis, you're looking at those three obstacle heights that I mentioned. And on the y, I'm plotting how high they're lifting their toes as they cross obstacles. So the higher the bars, the higher they're lifting their toes. The red bars stand for the leg that crosses the obstacle first. I'm going to refer to that as the crossing leg. 
the yellow bars, are the leg that follows along, and I'll call that the trailing leg. Okay, pay attention to these bars on the left, the yellow ones. What those are telling us is that children with normal BMIs, they're doing what we expect. They're lifting their toes higher to cross high versus low obstacles. Now pay attention to these yellow bars. Children with higher BMIs are actually doing the opposite. They're lifting their feet higher to cross those low versus high obstacles. That suggests that they're able to alter their walking movements to try to cope with the task at hand, but that they might be using less effective strategies. So lifting your foot higher to cross the low obstacle might actually not be necessary and might increase energy expenditure and not lifting your toe high enough to cross that high obstacle increases your risk of falling. All right, so if they're not lifting their toes higher to cross obstacles, then how are they getting over the obstacles? Here, I'm plotting hip motion, or how far outward they swing their hips or abduct them as they're crossing over obstacles. What we're looking at here is that for children with higher BMIs, with the crossing leg, they're swinging their hips out far to cross over low and high obstacles. So that motion increases as the height of the obstacle increases. That seems like a reasonable strategy, so what's the problem with that? Well, bringing their hips far out to the side exacerbates their already existing balance problems, increasing the risk of falling. I just told you a little bit about what they're doing with that trailing foot, so let me tell you more about what's happening with the trailing leg. Here, I'm showing you how bent their legs are when they're crossing obstacles. So the higher these bars, the straighter their legs are when they're crossing over. What we're seeing is that with the trailing leg, that children with higher BMIs are keeping that leg straighter when they're crossing low and high obstacles. That means that not only are they not lifting that foot high enough to clear the obstacles, they're also keeping their leg straight which increases their chances on catching their feet on whatever they're trying to step over. What are these results suggesting? Well, finding no differences on flat ground suggests that tasks beyond level walking might be more sensitive to differences in walking related to obesity. And finding differences in crossing obstacles with children who have higher BMIs suggests that they might be using less effective strategies to cross obstacles that increase their chances for falling. Well, if we eliminate excess body fat, does that take care of all of these difficulties? We asked that very same question in a special group of individuals using our same obstacle paradigm. We tested adults who were electing to undergo bariatric surgery. It is true that many of the comorbidities associated with obesity are reduced or completely eliminated after bariatric surgery. But you know what? Function is still affected. In a study of 167 adults, after surgery, 20% of them still reported falling. So what can we do? Others, including our lab, have shown improvements in walking on flat ground after surgery. Here I'm showing you how much time people spend with both feet on the ground as they walk before and after surgery. And we're finding that they're spending less time with both feet on the ground after surgery, suggesting less of a need to stabilize themselves as they walk. Actually though, our paradigm might be serving a bit of a rehabilitative purpose. Here I'm showing you how quickly they walk at the beginning of the study where they're walking on flat ground during the initial baseline condition and at the end when they're walking on flat ground again during that final baseline condition. We're finding that even before surgery that individuals are showing improvements in their walking. They're walking more quickly and our results also show that they're spending less time with both feet on the ground, they're taking longer steps, and spending more time balancing on one leg. In our future directions, we're looking at the effects of a motor intervention on motor function to see if providing training above and beyond massive weight loss might result in improvements in motor function. We also think that in terms of obesity, 
that not only weight matters, but that the brain matters too. And that understanding the role of the brain might help explain why massive weight loss alone doesn't eradicate the safety risks associated with obesity. So we're looking at the effects of inserting a cognitive task into our motor intervention to see whether that provides benefits to improve aspects of cognition related to planning motor movements. In sum, I'm arguing that getting moving is easier said than done. That four-year-old girl that I worked with 15 years ago was suffering from the effects that obesity had on her ability to tie her shoes, to get through an obstacle course without hurting herself. Because it's not just the quantity of movement, but the quality of movement that might be related to decreasing safety risks and to getting people moving. I'd like to acknowledge the organizations that fund my work in the lab, as well as my collaborators, and all of the wonderful staff and students who help make this work possible. Thank you for joining Health Matters.